Hey guys, Adam with Fanic here. Uh, today I want to cover a fun and simple topic about piping positional data into your robot and having it go to that position. Now, Fanic has a plethora of ways you can get this done. Um, we have stream motion and uh, PLC motion and Carol and dynamic path modifier and enhanced data access and blah, 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 blah. These are all very powerful, very elegant solutions that all cost money and time and might have too much horsepower for what you want to do. And today we're going to talk about the KISS principle. <laughs> Keep it simple, stupid. Um, so a lot of times people say, you know, Adam, I don't need all that horsepower that Fanuc has. I just want to give a number to the robot, have the robot go to that position. How hard can it be? You guys, it's not hard. So we're going to jump into that. Partway through this video, I'm also going to give you all a fun little tool, something you can take home uh, for free and enjoy it and love it. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. So we're going to dive into this. Um, we're going to go, go through it quickly, and um, hopefully uh, you get some good, good knowledge out of this. So what we're talking about today, we're talking about group I.O. So I.O. screen, type, fifth one down, group. As the name would so imply, group I.O. is a grouping of I.O.s. Thanks for watching my video. Hope you enjoyed no, I'm just kidding. That's not the end. Um, what, what we're going to be doing here... Uh, we're looking at taking something from binary and turning it into an integer. So when we say group I.O., think of having a bank of ones and zeros that are either on status or off status, uh, and we're going to convert that into a number that the robot can use. Uh, and that's because most of your Ethernet comms, your Profibus, your Profinet, Modbus TCP, all of those options give you thousands and thousands and thousands of discrete I.O., but they don't give you floating point integers. I want to show you how to work around that and some tips and tricks for setting up your robot to do that. All right, this is all tips and tricks. So let's set up some group IO. Um, I already set up three of them. I'm going to show you what I've done. Um, I'm assuming that this robot is talking to an Allen Bradley PLC over Ethernet as a slave or adapter. Um, so all of my group inputs are rack 89 slot one. That just means I'm talking over Ethernet, 89 and 1. That, that's my Ethernet comms. The next thing you'll see if I jump over here, it says number of points. This is how many bits do I want to lump together. You know, I could do an 8-bit integer, a 9, 10, 11, 12, whatever, but 16 happens to be a really good number, um, especially because it is unsigned. We're looking at only positive values. Um, a 16-bit integer, What's that going to look like, guys? Get out your handy-dandy programmer, programmer calculator. If your calculator is in this sissy standard mode, ditch that. Come on over to where the cool kids hang out. Um, if I have 16 bits of binary, who knows the answer? What's the largest integer I can write? If you had this committed to memory, you are a nerd. Um, so with a 16-bit, I can send any number to the robot between 0 and 65,535. Why is that number useful for this example? Well, it's because I have an LR mate that can only reach 700 millimeters uh, in general, and I won't be using near all of that because I just want to work in a little tray. So realistically, if I can write a value between a 0 and a 600 or 650, I'd be golden. You're saying, well, Adam, 650 is a little different than 65,000. That's because we are dealing with integers. So if I wanted to send 65535 to the robot, the first thing I'm going to end up doing in my robot code is divide that by 100. Now I have decimal places to work with. That way, when your PLC is sending ones and zeros, you're going to end up with a three-digit and two-decimal place value for the robot to go to. So you can already see how we're taking something so 
basic and common and ordinary as discrete I.O. and turning it into a very useful granular number. That sounds awesome on paper. Let's do it on the teach pendant. So I've showed you how to um, configure these. Well, I've mentioned it. Uh, if you wanted to configure more, like right now I'm going to do an X, a Y, and a Z. If I wanted a yaw, a pitch, and a roll, let, we would just configure more. Um, notice that when you go to start configuring these, the robot gives you a love note. The robot wants what's best for you in life. It says power off, then on to enable changes. So as you start putting in what you want all your I.O. to be mapped, make sure that you cycle power on the robot for those changes to take effect, or you will be very confused as to why nothing works. So we've got our I.O. mapped and ready to use. Um, the next thing that's definitely important is this whole concept of I can only do positives, right? Like, for example, if we try to break this thing and put a big number in, the robot, out of love, yells at you, scolds you, says, I need an integer between 0 and 65535. Well, that could be your problem, right? Um, let's look at this robot position right now in world coordinates, okay? Keep in mind, world coordinates mean almost nothing to you, which is why you should always make your user frames. But in world coordinates, uh, remember that on an LR mate, we're looking at the robot belly button. So look at my X. This J6 orb is 333 millimeters forward. Okay. It is negative 42 in the Y, which the Y direction is over here. And it's positive 200 in the Z. Well, what happens if I wanted this robot to go down into my tray? Look what I have. 439, negative 294 and negative 324. Well, that's not going to fly with this method that I'm teaching you. So what do we do? I recommend that you be a good programmer and you program yourself a user frame. I've gone ahead and set up a user frame that puts my origin down into the corner of the tray. You can see I can move my uh, frame anywhere. I'm putting it down in the frame, down in the tray, because now that means that anything I want to pick inside of this tray is going to be positive. Because the bottom of the tray would be Z0, okay? So anything up or tray level would be 0 or greater. X0 and Y0 is way in the corner. Your part is definitely not in the corner. So by training a user frame, let's apply that and go here. Show me where I am in user. Click. Look where this robot is now. Got a lot of positive values going on. Um, for this example, we're not going to talk yaw, pitch, and roll, uh, just because I want to go in and out of a tray. But um, you can always do your yaw as a positive 180. It's, you're going to be fine. And 0, 0. Don't worry about those. But for this example, I want X, Y, Z. I want everything positive. That's your first trick. Speaking of tricks and frames and positives and X, Y, Zs, I wanted to touch on something that I got some feedback from on my last video. I, I, I happened to mention a robot gang sign. The gang sign, no, that is not a formal fanic term, but it is an atom term. And uh, if you find me in a dark alley uh, and I hold you up for all your uh, code backups, all you have to do is flash this. This is the robot gang sign. Little help from my little model robots I got at the office here. If you look at what I'm talking about when I say that, take your right hand. It's important that it's your right hand. Think to vector calculus, right hand rule. Take your right hand, and if the back of your hand faces the back of the robot, which the back of the robot is where the cables go in, if the back of you faces the back of the robot, then what happens is, your index finger is your positive x direction in Cartesian. Your middle finger is your positive y Cartesian. And your thumb becomes positive z. So here's your free tool that you can all have and take home. You, you can thank me later. 
Uh, if you have a right hand, you have a working triad for Fanet Cartesian positions. Uh, use the robot gang sign, right hand rule, and now you'll know which direction that robot's going to go if you hit Y plus um, or Z plus or Z minus. Uh, this has helped me out countless times when, when helping people. Um, you'll often see me holding the teach pendant, pull out my hand and think, oh yeah, I need to go negative Y, things like that. So keep your right hand rule handy, guys. X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. You'll see it there. See it everywhere. X, Y, Z. So we've covered um, how to keep things positive, which is just setting up a user frame. Should be doing that. We've covered um, configuring our IOs. So that's wonderful. Now we've got to show you the code that will actually make this work. So what I've done is I've put together a little git pause program. It is little. It is brief. It is succinct and it is K-I-S-S -S simple. Um, but let's dissect it. What I've done is using the instructions tab, registers, and go all the way down to this special one. You'll notice that one and eight look similar, but they're a little different. This one's got the paren. If I hit that, one of my options is to write to individual elements of a PR. So if I click on my PR, I can say position register number five, which I've named as my go-to, element number one, which would be my X axis, uh, my X element. Remember, my elements are in order, X, Y, Z, yaw, pitch, roll, one, two, three, four, five, six. What do I want it to be? I want my X element to be that group input that we set up. I want it to be group input one. But remember what I said, uh, this, these are integers. And sometimes just, you know, sometimes you can't get close enough with one millimeter resolution. You might need sub millimeter. So we go to this insert key, divide by one, one three. So you'll see that what we're doing, remember we write from the right to left, is I'm going to take whatever data is in GI1. I'm going to take that number that I got from the PLC. I'm going to divide it by 100 and I'm gonna dump the result into here. So let me show you on the back end what that looks like. Um, in my PRs, I have one called go to. Um, if we look at it, I can go ahead and zero these out. Remember I'm leaving yaw, pitch, and roll alone. These values are just telling the robot to be wrist down right now. Um, it's just letting the robot know that we're working at right angles, uh, normal to this surface. But X, Y, Z, I'm leaving those as zero right now in my go-to. Um, and we'll be populating them via whatever numbers are in here. Um, so for example, if I wanted to, I could say 320, and then you know we're dividing by 100. So 320.55, but there's no dot, that'd be my X. Um, that would be 300 millimeters from here. So I'd put you up here. Um, my Y, let's make it be like 50.00. And then my Z, yeah, let's just let it be, well, let's just put a number in there. So I'd have 320.55 by 50.0 by 10.0 being pushed into here. Let's make sure this all works by playing with my program. Um, here's how I've written it. Always have your header, guys. Define that user frame. What user frame are we using? Where? What's active? User tool. Even if I don't have a tool, good boy. Keep it written. Set your payload. Set your speed. The first thing my program does after the header, the very first thing I do is I call my get position program. So it's going to go and update the data and then come back. Robot's going to start at my home position, which I've just taught up in space. And then here's my everyday pick and place. Go to with an offset. Then go to again. Wait. And then go back up. If you're wondering how the offsets work, please watch my video on how to use offsets. I go into great detail there. And then we go back home. Super duper simple. 
So let's take a fun look at everything behind the scenes. Here's my program. Here's my group IO. Here's my positions. Let's first run this and then we'll, we'll uh, play around with it. So here we go. Robot starts at home. It's going to approach, go down, go up, go home. So that robot just went to these values. We can prove that because just momentarily, just a minute ago, I had all those at 0, 320.55, 50.0, 10.0. You can see that it got populated into that position. Let's do something else. Um, let's, uh, let's, let's 320, well, I don't know, just changing it. But let's drastically change the Y. Let's move this thing, I don't know. Let's try and break stuff. Who knows? Maybe I'll, maybe I'll blow everything up. And Z can be 1, 5, or whatever. There we go. Totally messing it up. Let's see where it should go. You would expect that the X should still be up in this region. Remember your right hand rule, robot gang sign. X should still be here. But my Y should be a half a meter over here. Let's see if I can even reach it. Watch, watch this thing blow up in my face. Oh, it's working. So that robot's going to come down and go to a totally different tray, go pick that point, and come back home. So again, I've got one program. Program has not changed. I've got one point. It's not even a top point. It's, there's no top point. It's a PR that just gets updated. We have one basic program that all it does is look for the data from the PLC, update it, and goes there. Super simple. Let's go look at that. 320.11, 550.21, and then 15.49. It works like a champ, and it's easy, and it's cost-effective, and it's great, and it's beautiful because robots are fun. And now you all also have this wonderful tool of your X, Y, Z uh, right-hand rule uh, robot gang sign, uh, trademarked by Adam. And, uh, you guys, I, I just, I hope this kind of stuff helps these little tips and tricks, setting up your frames. Um, drop me a comment below. Um, I'm always open to new topics, uh, for upcoming videos. Um, I've got a few in the queue, but I'd like more in the queue. So let me know what you want to learn. Um, and as always have fun coding.